Welcome to Brain of Vets. We are truly delighted to be joined by one of the world's most influential philosophers, Martha Nussbaum, and we're going to be talking about disgust. Martha, would you like to start with some cases? Yeah, I want to give you some of the cases that Paul Rosen used in his experiments. So he knew that most people think disgust has no cognitive content at all, and he wanted to show that it does. So what he did was give people a thing to smell, and he told people what they were supposed to think it was. If they were told that it was cheese, they normally liked the smell, but the very same thing, if they were told that it was feces, they really found it disgusting. So the disgust response was mediated by ideas. But then later on, he gets into other things. So for example, I mean, he was trying to show that disgust is transmitted by ideas of contamination. So he gives people a cockroach that's sealed within an indigestible plastic capsule that will pass through the digestive tract and come out the other side. And they know this. And yet no one will actually swallow it. They don't want it inside them, whether it will do them any harm or not. Another thing he did was to give people a spoon to stir soup with that was shaped like a fly swatter and they would use it, but then they would not eat the soup afterwards. So that's the kind of thing he did to show that it's people's ideas about contamination that govern their disgust response. So suppose we accept that disgust has cognitive content. In other words, there's certain thoughts involved. What exactly is it that disgusts us? Yeah, well, this is the question, right? So it isn't simply distaste that he's shown. He also wanted to argue that it's not simply fear of danger. Now, in evolutionary terms, it probably has something to do with steering us away from danger, but there are plenty of things that are disgusting without being particularly dangerous. And there are lots of things that are very dangerous, but not disgusting. Poisonous mushrooms being a notorious example. We can't tell which kinds of mushrooms we should eat by thinking which ones disgust us. So that's not a perfect correlation. So what is it about? What Rosen finds is that in every case, what disgusts us is something having to do with our aversion to things that remind us of our animality and mortality. So it's either animals that are themselves oozy, squishy, slimy, like cockroaches, bugs, and so on, or things about people that seem to remind us of that sliminess, bad smell, and so on. Now, of course, that's the first stage. The first stage is that we're disgusted by things that actually have certain sensory properties that remind us of our animality. The corpse is an obvious case. But then what happens in societies, it's not enough to keep yourself safe from the things that actually have these sensory properties. I would call those primary disgust objects. But people then draw a further line. Certain people, and it's always some subordinate group, have these properties projected onto them. Bad smell, hyper bodiliness, hypersexuality, and then they're imputed to be the animals among us, and they are found disgusting, even though, of course, they smell just the same as people in the dominant group, but the people in the dominant group like to think that they're kind of angels above the usual stench and decay of the body. So that is what I call projective disgust, and that is the kind that's particularly damaging. I think even the primary kind is kind of damaging because it's telling yourself, I got to get away from my animality. That's why I chose for my first book the title Hiding from Humanity. And of course, if you read Swift's Gulliver's Travels, you see what that does to Gulliver, just the idea that he, his own animal body is something he has to flee from, makes it impossible for him to live with his wife and his children at the end of the novel. But it's much worse when you segment society along the lines of projected disgust. And it's always different groups. Sometimes it's the racial group, sometimes the gender group, sometimes the sexual orientation group, sometimes the disability group or an age-based group. So the group onto which the discussed properties are projecting is not always the same, but it, there always is something. There's no known society in which people do not do this thing of projecting onto some group, probably already weak and subordinated these properties. And then of course that ensures further subordination and avoidance. So that is the thing I've been primarily concerned with. 
And in my first book, I analyze it thematically and then look at its influence in the law. So obviously in legal theory and in legal practice, disgust plays quite a significant role. Lord Devlin said that the responses of disgust in the average member of society are a sufficient reason to make something illegal, even though it causes no harm to non-consenting parties. Use that as an argument against the decriminalization of same-sex relations. Now, Devlin's argument really you know, is comparable with my analysis of disgust as constructed and conventional, because he really was talking about social solidarity. But there's another philosopher, used to be at my own university, Leon Cass, who for a long time was head of the President's Council on Bioethics. He thought disgust was implanted in us at birth as a kind of divine mechanism, he was quite religious, to steer us away from unspeakable things. So he thought disgust was reliable, but not because of convention, like devil, but because of a kind of divine instinct that it gave us to avoid things that were really awful and went beyond some line. But both of them thought you could make law on that basis, and they encouraged people to do that. Whereas, of course, once you realize that it's based on rather phobic constructions of animality and mortality, you might call that into question, which is what I then proceed to do. So one of the things that you start off by talking about is how even if you explain to someone that they suffer no risk of genuine harm, the disgust feeling is still so overpowering in their refusal to eat the encapsulated cockroach or drink from the soup that has the fly swatter in it. And that gives us an indication why it's such a powerful vilification tool that you can bypass people's rational processes and you can target a group and say they're disgusting and you don't need a good argument for it you just need to rely on people's sentiment towards them yeah and, no of course uh, even with primary objects it's pretty unfortunate that people can't look at things rationally but as i say it's not so damaging because if we don't have time to test everything for bacteria and so if we follow our disgust response it's not too bad but in society it's very damaging because as you say, it's sticky. So if people learn disgust in their childhood, it's very hard for them to get rid of it. There are stories about people who move from the South to the North where there's more racial integration in society in the 19th century. And sitting at a mixed race table, these people felt horrible disgust. They had to leave the table because they were seated next to people of the black race. So that is something that happens all the time, e even when people in their hearts, they might know it's wrong. And I saw this in my own life because my father came from the deep south and he had that kind of response to blacks and he thought it was going to contaminate others in turn. So I was doing some acting when I was in high school and I was in this theater group that was going to take a trip together. And one member of this group was black. And my father said, no daughter of mine will appear in public with a black man. Well, we were living in Philadelphia, so people around me didn't think that way, although their thoughts were not too great either, but none that it wasn't quite like that. And what did he think? He thought that it would taint me by proximity to this black person. He didn't actually think that I was dating this person, and I wasn't. Then much later, when I actually did marry a Jewish man, my father had the same reaction to that. And he always brought me up saying Jews smell bad and they smoke big cigars and they're vulgar. But this man I married came from a family that was such an elite Viennese family that thought of the beautiful and the fine and stuff. I thought, naively, that when he met the actual people, this would go away. And at first it did not. What was quite interesting was that he just refused to be there. He just didn't even go to my wedding. Much later, though, he actually did get to know my husband, and he found him quite, as I expected, quite similar to himself and quite a nice person. But yeah, I think you can unlearn it in specific cases. And we know this about disgust towards gays and lesbians, that the families often do, sometimes with great difficulty, overcome their disgust. And then they often become robust advocates for their children. So when people do campaigning for gay rights, it's been found that the most effective way to campaign for gay rights laws is to show the parents, because the parents 
are accepted by the others that you want to convert, but they're saying that their children are not disgusting. I had a colleague who was a libertarian and he really thought that it was ridiculous to have laws against the same sex acts or even same sex marriage. He said, marriage is an obvious case of freedom of contract. But then he said, well, that sort of thing disgusts me and I just don't want to have anything to do with it, but law should be rational. Then it turned out that one of his children was gay and right away he lost the disgust response because he'd been embracing this lovely man for a long time. He just had to make his views consistent in the other direction and think that, well, it's not disgusting after all. So, so these things can change, but usually it's only when you already know and love some person. I'm curious about a kind of case that might present a counter example to your account. It might, I'm not sure you'll have to let me know. So in the case of gay men, it makes sense because gay men identified with certain types of behaviors, which reminds people who are disgusted by them of our humanity and our sexuality and our animality. I can get that. I can get it in the race case because there's false beliefs about smell or what the nature of skin color is. I understand that. I'm interested in transphobia though. So someone who's disgusted by a transsexual is someone who's disgusted by what? Because they're transitioning from a gender which we're not disgusted by to another gender which we're not disgusted by. So what, where does the disgust enter if there is disgust? That I think is a very interesting question. And I think we don't understand it perfectly and there hasn't been much research on that. But I think it's just somehow creepy to think of the body as malleable in that way. We're comfortable thinking the body is fixed. Yes, or even that. But to start thinking of the body itself as fluid and that you can kind of move from one kind of body to another kind of body, that I think is what people find creepy. So that's my best stab at it. It's hard to know. I mean, I only know three trans people. So the sample is quite small. And in the case of the you know, famous economist, Deirdre McCloskey, who wrote her autobiography, she found that the people who knew her already, the economists, that is, who knew her as Donald McCloskey, they were the ones who stood by her, whereas her own family was so creeped out. I mean, particularly the wife was so creeped out by the fact that she'd been having sex with Donald and had children with Donald. And now suddenly this person is saying, I'm Deirdre. And, and her being totally creeped out by what kind of body have I had, what kind of acts have I been committing? That was the source, apparently, of her disgust. Whereas the economists, what was so interesting is that economists are usually not a very liberal budge, but when the family had committed Yerdra to a mental institution, it was the Economic History Association that marched down to the institution and bailed her out. So that's the case that I know best because she wrote about it so well. The other two that I know are younger, and therefore they've been supported all the way along by their parents and by their colleagues, so it's harder to know. So it seems like there can be a paradox with disgust. People can often be attracted to artworks that are macabre or distasteful or explore the human condition decaying, the death, and there can even be a sense in which people feel both revulsion and attraction to the same thing. And then others have a meta level of disgust. In other words, they are upset that some people are attracted to something that they find disgusting. And that's partly why they want a legal prohibition. So we can imagine this, let's say, manifesting in certain kinds of extreme pornography where a lot of people would find it very disgusting. You could imagine a pornography that involves lots of bodily fluids, for example, has multiple couples together crossing various sex gender lines. Do you think there's any case for prohibition on that? What do you think the correct approach that people who despise this activity ought to, ought to have? Well, I think the case based on disgust has no merit. Now, usually pornography legislation has been based on moral contamination of some sort, and I don't think that's a good case either. But the case that the radical feminists, Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin, make out is a different case, namely that there's a reliable causal link between repeated viewing of this type of pornography, violent pornography, where women are humiliated and beaten, and the actual beating of women. And the empirical evidence we can argue about, but a lot of empirical correlations, like between smoking and various diseases, 
are not that robust. So I have a student who wrote an article saying the correlation is just about as strong as that. So I think at least they're in the right ballpark. They're in the ballpark of harm. And they want to have what is sort of like dangerous product legislation, the kind of argument that was made for banning alcohol on the grounds that it's a dangerous drug that causes harm to individuals and then to families, and the kind of argument that's made today about hard drugs. So I don't really like those kinds of arguments. I'm pretty much a libertarian about drugs, although I feel conflicted in the case of hard drugs, because I think putting something under the banner of legality might encourage kids to mess up their lives in terrible ways. But anyway, I think that's the right bullpark to talk about harm. And it never got off the ground with pornography, I think, because people just would rather keep their cherished pleasures. And so one to one ordinance that was actually passed was overturned by the <laughs> Circuit Court of Appeals. And then there was another one in Minneapolis that was ultimately vetoed by the mayor of the city. But they're interesting here. So there's this whole volume, which they nicely entitled In Harm's Way, showing what the women said about how the men got into this habit of reading the pornography and then they needed an outlet. And so they took the women as the outlet and they reenacted pornographic scenarios with the woman. So we know this kind of copycat thing is a feature of a lot of criminality. Even modest and sort of mild men pornography like this 50 Shades of Grey, we know there are criminal cases of copycat and enactment where there's real harm to women. Now, so one reason against laws is you can't draw the line. The 50 Shades of Grey causes harm, well, pretty much anything. And if you might think Dostoevsky's crime and punishment might encourage murders, well, it might. But you don't want to blame Dostoevsky for that. So that's one reason that I would not support such laws. But the other thing about it is the connection between the viewing and the harming is hard to make out because maybe the person sought out pornography because they already had those fantasies and they, for a while, that was enough. And then after a while, it's not enough. So I guess I think what is really important is that sex acts should not take place without consent. And if they're really creepy, that's okay, so long as there's consent. I've been very interested in following the discussions of the allegations against Army Hammer. Do you know about this? A group of women have come forward to say that Army Hammer engaged in really weird practices involving drinking blood and some mild forms of cannibalism. So that's one thing. But they also claim that they did not fully consent. And what I like about the public response is they focus on the absence of consent. So the fact that he did these creepy things, okay, if people really consent. And people from the BDSM community have said, well, look, our rules are you got to have safe words, you got to have real consent. And he didn't have that. So I think that's right. That's the right place to draw the line around harm and consent. It seems like just on the notion of pornography, that people have strange double standards when it comes to disgust. So someone who's heterosexual might say, I'm disgusted by homosexual pornography, and someone who's homosexual might say, I'm disgusted by heterosexual pornography. But both involve carnality and the assertion of the animal instinct. So if what disgust is about is, is that reinforcement of the animal, then surely we should be disgusted regardless. No, okay, but what is it that disgusts the person? I mean, I agree totally, namely, a lot of straight pornography does even involve two women having sex with each other. That's supposed to be very titillating. But what <clears throat> men really are opposed to is the thought that they might be penetrated by another man. So anal intercourse has always been focused at anti-gay pamphlets and anti-gay legal drives. I've worked a lot on the Colorado case, and the person who had this referendum in Colorado to subject gays and lesbians to legal standards for passing anti-discrimination laws. <clears throat> he circulated pamphlets saying gays eat feces and drink raw blood to make people disgusted and creeped out. But it's the thought that you yourself would be the object of that. That's why men are so weird about showers. So they don't want showers in the military because showers would be, at least you would be gazed at in a way that indicated possible penetration. 
and they just would rather not think about them. So certain things that are in pornography, like with two women making love with each other, don't make you think anything that would happen to you would be bad. You would quite like it if you could have these two women around and you could make love with both of them. But it's the thought that you would be penetrated that I think is really threatening because then you would be used. Men don't like the thought of being penetrated. I remember talking to a high ranking federal judge, whose name I won't give, about why at the age of, I think he was then 63 or four, he had not ever had a colonoscopy. And I just said, this is very irrational and you're a very rational person. Why don't you do this? He said, well, we men don't like to be penetrated. So, you know, that, I think that it was very profound and that, that was exactly what he was worried about. And I think a lot of people who are female too are disgusted by colonoscopies because it's a way of being penetrated in terms of their own animality and it's being brought up close against the mixing of blood and feces and so on. So the very same women in my generation who wrote and read our bodies ourselves and who said, oh, I would look at my vagina speculum and nothing will disgust me. All of a sudden, when they get older and they're having colonoscopies, they want to be knocked out. Most colonoscopies in the U.S. now take place not only under sedation, but under general anesthesia. Partly, it's a profit-making scam by the hospitals. But of course, there are no pain nerves in the colon, so there's absolutely no reason for it. And it actually does harm because you can't say if something does happen to hurt, but also you lose a whole day of work. The person who drives you there loses a whole day of work. And it's actually not problematic. I've had four colonoscopies with no sedation. And I can tell you, it's quite interesting to see your insides. But I think people don't want to see their insides because they would realize that they are actually these PCs and blood mixing up in there. And that would remind them of their animality and, of course, of their mortality. So would you say then that disgust is just a subspecies of fear, that it's a particular type of fear, or are they distinct? Well, I think some people have said that, but I think that's too simple because there are things that disgust us, even though we know that all danger is removed. So if there is fear, it's fear of a very strange kind. It's not the usual fear where there's actually an imminent thought of danger. So I think it's not just that, but it's a specific desire not to be contaminated. What Rosen's experiments show is that you don't want to take in, either through the mouth or through some other portal of the body, something that's a reminder of your own animality. I think that's why colonoscopy is so, so powerful, actually. So anyway, that's different from fear. I mean, ultimately, it may all come back to the fear of death in some form. I'm happy to go there. But I think it's by a more complicated route than simply fearing a specific experience. So might there be a virtue in exploring one's initial disgust? In other words, saying that maybe where it doesn't have a rational connection, where it's not preventing you from getting an illness, that you ought to overcome the disgust. And especially if I think about the example that you give of your father, where he's able to overcome his anti-Semitic disgust, we think that's progress. Are there other kinds of things where we say, well, you might have a moral obligation to develop yourself to remove the disgust? Or is there some sort of aesthetic taste? In other words, you can say, well, look, I'm disgusted by roast chicken and you find it delightful and I'm entitled to my disgust. It's like any other kind of taste. And we ought not to be policing people's uh, desires. Yeah, look, I think there is a lot of difference of taste and often it doesn't mean very much, but I do think that there are cases where it does. Though I myself am a big animal rights advocate and over the years I've become quite disgusted by the smell of meat, but that's because of an ideation that connects it with pain and harm to animals. And one of the things I don't like with some of Rosen's tests for, for what he calls the D scale is that he gives examples where animals are subjected to harm and rape and so forth, as though there were no ethical component to that. And of course there is. So, so I think that's one problem, but in the social case, I mean, so I don't want to overcome my disgust at meat. And if people have it because they think of harm to animals, I think that's fine. However, we know that there are other cases of disgust and the smell of meat that are connected with social subordination. So I know Muslim friends in India who could not 
move into a certain area in Delhi because their neighbors would say, oh, I would smell beef. That would disgust me. Well, of course, beef smells the same as the things they do eat, lamb and chicken and so forth. So it's a particular ideation having to do with the hatred of Muslims. And so that we certainly should try to overcome. And I think the social, the projective kind, has no good role to play at all, period. Now, Freud did think that some degree of disgust is a part of normal sexual life. I just don't believe that. I don't see why he wanted to say that. Maybe in the 19th century and where there was such repression that people did find suddenly sexuality disgusting and women's bodies disgusting. But if so, too bad for that. And around that were all kinds of taboos against women in public life. Things around menstruation, breastfeeding. We're still dealing with that today. Can female politicians breastfeed babies in Congress and so forth? So we should get rid of those things and we should get rid of them right away. My senator, Tammy Duckworth, who was a kind of double disgust object because she lost both of her legs as a pilot in Iraq and therefore he, she's subject to disability disgust, which we can talk about later. But she also <clears throat> gave birth at the age of over 40 and she has been an advocate for breastfeeding for babies in Congress. And I think actually passed a law on that, although New Zealand was the famous case that went first with Jacinta Ardern. But yeah, we should struggle against disgust. The idea that breastfeeding was obscene, there are actually definitions of obscenity that include breastfeeding. Why would people think that? What would be their problem? It's just they don't want to be reminded too vividly of embodiment. And they think women are kind of the vehicle of embodiment more than men. Because men often have tricked themselves into thinking they're not really bodies. They're sort of like angels. They don't get penetrated. And if they do ejaculate, they leave it behind in someone else's body. So I guess they think that they're not really bodies and therefore they would never do anything gross and creepy as breastfeeding. Do you think disgust is then inherently ir irrational? Because if we're trying to forget the kind of creatures we are, then it seems like it's delusional at its base, at its core. And if it is irrational, Suppose we were to not only wipe out these secondary cases of disgust, so not only disgust at other social groups or certain social practices, but suppose we wiped out primary disgust as well, so the disgust that children are brought up to have with their feces, etc. Suppose we were to wipe out primary disgust, would we be in a better world? Well, as I said before, we don't have time to test everything for bacterial contamination, and disgust has evolved as a useful heuristic the smell of spoiled milk and spoiled food is useful. And of course, the smell of the corpse is not only disgusting, but it's also quite useful because corpses are very dangerous to manipulate and make contact with and so forth. So I'm not for wiping out primary disgust because it would just take too much time to figure out what we should touch and what we shouldn't touch. But I think the projective kind of disgust, yeah, I think we should wipe it out. Absolutely. And by the fact that it's so very, we can see that it's just not needed. What I think we could say is that the reasons all societies have it probably has a kind of usefulness, namely that societies do better when they're stratified, like with like, subordinate with subordinate, do better in some evolutionary sense, but not morally better. And now we've progressed far enough that we can get rid of the morally hideous forms of subordination, and we're trying to do that, even though we know that the human species has evolved in a way that it loves subordination and fear of people who are unlike you, but you also can learn to find them disgusting. And that kind of gives an additional oomph to your fear, for example. So I think that it will be very hard to wipe out these types of disgust. We see that India, which has had the caste hierarchy for a long time, and has had the untouchables genuinely um, disgusting, even by virtuous people who wanted not to find them that. They have not been able to overcome that in 75 years since independence. 80% of Hindu households in India still observe untouchability in the kitchen. In other words, they won't eat food that's cooked or touched 
by a person from the Dalit groups. That's pretty extraordinary. I mean, we like to think we're doing pretty badly in America in terms of race, and I think we are. But we certainly have plenty of intermarriage, and we never, well, we've had discussed thoughts in our past where white lower castes of India can't share drinking fountains, can't share swimming pools and all that. And of course, South Africa has had those cases too. But today, we do a lot of mixing and a lot of intermarriage. And I think the idea that you would find it disgusting to touch something that a black person had touched, that's not a very common idea. I'm sure it's still there in some form, in some places. But I think in India, it has stayed stuck, largely because the lower castes have so little opportunity for education. The people actually don't mingle with them. They only see them in the subordinate capacity. So as I was going to say to you before, we did this large comparative project with our center in Delhi, where we had researchers from US and from India talking about the different types of disgust. And we found great similarities between the caste hierarchy and disgust towards African Americans in America with just little minor nuances of crazy irrational difference. So take the kitchen. So obviously in the deep south, cooks were often black. They prepared the family spoon. They served the family spoon. Although, interestingly, the plates on which they themselves ate were regarded as contaminated and had to be sometimes thrown away afterwards. So it was something about their saliva mixing with the food or something like that. But they could serve food to the family. In India, that's the quintessence of what is found disgusting. Rabindranath Tagore, the great humanist and educator and not Nobel Prize winning fiction writer, he wrote a novel called Gora about a young man who thinks that he's going to revive traditional Hinduism. This was way back in the 1930s. And so Gora thinks that it would be good to bring back all the old customs in their strictest form to create greater solidarity among Hindus. His name tips off the reader because the name means pale face. But we, and we learn pretty soon that he's actually not born a Hindu at all. He was actually the child of an Irish woman in the 1857 mutiny. And she left this child to Gora's mother and said, please bring up my child. And the mother, a very compassionate woman, brought him up as her own child. And so that's who Rora actually is. And he hates the fact that his mother has employed a Christian cook because Christians didn't belong to any caste. And typically they were converts from the very lowest castes. And so he keeps trying to say, I won't eat the food cooked by this cook, et cetera. And then of course the novel builds to the climax where he discovers that he himself is the result of a kind of casteless state where he really can't bring back the traditional customs because he can't be a Hindu. So anyway, that just teaches him, well, and then he actually starts thinking <laughs> and he thinks, well, maybe being an Indian has got to mean something different from that. And so this was Tagore, who of course was a great educator, saying that when we found the nation, we can't build it on these terrible taboos about disgust. He has some dance dramas too, where the whole question of this woman who's from an untouchable caste, a Dalit, she wants some water, no one will give her water. And this is a heartbreaking dance because she goes around and looks for water. And finally, a Buddhist gives her water. And so anyway, that's what Tagore was concerned with, was openness. And Buddhism, of course, was the counterforce to Hinduism in that respect. The founder of the Indian constitution, the greatest legal mind, I think, of the 20th century, B.R. Ambedkar was himself a Dalit, and he and his entire caste converted to Buddhism. They were a caste whose destiny was supposed to be to sweep the refuse from the streets. So he converted to Buddhism with all his caste in order to make that statement that we're going to get rid of caste entirely. So I think that's basically what we should do. I've just taught a course in which we read Ambedkar's great work, Annihilation of Caste. You say to Gandhi, who was a more moderate person on this issue, don't just get rid of untouchability, get rid of the whole structure that supports it. We have to get rid of the whole caste hierarchy and the mandatory division of labor, or we haven't really gotten rid of untouchability. And that's what I think. I'm quite radical on this.
But at least I would be prepared to say, let's get rid of all gross harms done to people because of a disgust ideology. What's striking about reading Hiding from Humanity, you have all these cases of people who killed homosexuals because they felt revulsion. And so you have, there's a case of someone who stumbles upon a lesbian couple having sex and he kills them because he says, I just had this strong disgust impulse. You talk about Oscar Wilde sentencing, where the judge can't even say what he's been sentenced for, but it's, it's so heavily hinted at, and he says it's the most vile thing that could be done. And I mean, your book comes out in 2004, and it's interesting how much has changed in that time. It's written just after Lawrence versus Texas, so sodomy is nationally decriminalized in America, and gay marriage is yet to come. South Africa achieved gay marriage in 2006, America followed suit. But it's interesting to see how social attitudes have shifted, and I wonder, if the disgust underlying some of those things has shifted as well, or whether people just hide it. In other words, they say, the mores have shifted, it's now incredibly unpopular for me to say that I'm repelled by the other, and so I'll be obedient, even if I do feel disgusted, or whether it itself disappears. If we think about depictions of homosexual kissing over time, very rare thing to see on television in the 90s. It would have been a startling. There's an episode of Ellen where she comes out and sort of yes. sends shockwaves. Now, I think it's so commonplace to have homosexual sex on movies and film and in magazines, and young people seem to think nothing of it. So I wonder if the norm has disappeared. Well, it's very rapid, isn't it? Now, England was way ahead because they decriminalized same-sex relations in 1967. And back then, of course, they had done brutal and terrible things, like the chemical castration of Alan Turing, which led to his suicide. I'm writing now a book about Benjamin Britten's War Requiem, which involves me in talking quite a lot about his 39-year partnership with Peter Pears, the singer. And they were a pretty out gay couple, well before such things were accepted. And they dealt with it with great dignity and great grace. And Britten wrote cycles of love songs for peers, and they perform them in public. Very interesting that in certain communities, like the arts community, that was accepted. And when Michelangelo's sonnets are so beautifully sung by peers with Britain at the piano, what did people think? Well, I think the music community was already on board, and the royal family was on board. They were great friends of the queen mother, the queen, the current queen was a great friend of theirs later and made Britain Baron Britain of Aldeburgh. So England moved more rapidly, particularly in certain circles. The US, I think because of the strong influence of fundamentalist religion, was slower. But as you say, I mean, when I first wrote about this topic, it was partly out of my experience in theater. I used to be a professional actress for a while. And I just thought, here are these lovely men who are in many ways much nicer than the heterosexual men that I'm stating. And I thought they should be able to be happy. Why aren't they happy? And they could be open in the theater, but not anywhere else. And so I got involved and I started writing on this. And in those days, if you were ready to talk about it, everyone wanted you to do that because a lot of people who were closeted wouldn't speak up for themselves, lest it spoil their career in the law or whatever. There are no people who would have been federal judges if they haven't been outed in some way as homosexual. So what happens so quickly? It's quite astonishing, isn't it? And I think it has a lot to do with young people. So if you, first of all, families, so people know that one of their children is gay and then they have friends and friends meet this person who's gay and the parents are supporting that. And then in schools, certain schools, People are encouraged to be openly gay, and that makes a big difference. And I've seen people who grow up in such schools just have wonderful open lives where they live like straight people, not everywhere in the country by any means, but in certain places. But I think there's something else because norms around women's full equality, I have to say, they have not changed as rapidly. So why is it that norms around women's equality have changed? less rapidly. Well, one thing is, of course, that while gay men especially were in the closet, they could advance in society and make a lot of money and have a lot of influence. But no, I think there's something about people's self-interested fear, because women's equality 
makes a demand for men to change. If you are going to have a marriage based on real equality, that's a big demand. You have to be prepared to share in childcare, increasingly elder care. You have to redesign the professions. Whereas being nice to and really quite warmly accepting a gay couple who lives next door doesn't demand change of you. There's no concept of being a real man that requires you to subordinate gay people, but it sure has required the subordination of women. So I think there's much more struggle around things that are involved in your daily life. And when I first spoke about same-sex issues, I guess it was around 1984 when there were first conferences being given on that topic. And I had friends, John Boswell, Jack Winkler, David Halperin, who encouraged me to get involved, write about Greek homosexuality, but also just a whole conference was discussing the whole issue. But that was very early and no one was prepared to hear that. But all of a sudden, from then till now, there's been this tremendous sweep of change. And I do think that now in many parts of the country, it just seems normal. Now, I have to say, not everywhere. So what is happening with Florida's don't say gay law, they don't want kids to be taught that it's okay to be gay. Well, I think what is happening is the conservative religious groups are all against this. They're particularly transphobic but they're also homophobic. So there's a lot of resistance, but even then, I mean, even the conservative Supreme Court, this summer, this past summer, a year ago, they said that discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation and transgender, interestingly enough, was sex discrimination within the meaning of our Title VII law, which protects people against sex discrimination. So it was Justice Gorsuch writing this opinion. Now, I don't know what he thinks in his heart, and I think he's just a rationalist, but he was not deterred by disgust the way in an early generation someone would be. So I think it's probably families and kids growing up with other gay kids, and just the idea, okay, that you could have a kid who might be gay, and what would you want to have around that kid? Would want society to support that kid? Same with disability. I think there's been great progress on issues of disability because the dominant group knows that you could give birth to a child with a major disability. Not the same with race. <laughs> Most people in the nominative group, oh, never have a child who's black. So if they hate blacks, they don't have this worrying thought that their own child might be disadvantaged by their hatred and disgust. So I think there's a lot more racial disgust now in America than there is homophobic disgust or disability disgust. So that, that has just to do with the families, people form and what they think might happen to their own children. You spoke around conservative disgust. Do you think it's a partisan issue? So do you think disgust is used by both sides on the political, political spectrum or is this really a conservative issue? Well, the kind of disgust I'm talking about is definitely, I wouldn't, wouldn't even want to say conservative. I would just say a right-wing issue, but I don't, I mean, there are plenty of conservatives who don't have that. Look at Dick Cheney, whose daughter is lesbian, and he was firmly in defense of same-sex marriage and same-sex rights. And of course, his other daughter, Liz, who used to be rather homophobic when she was a student of mine in law school. Now she's become quite a blazing advocate for a kind of sensible, rationalist conservatism. So it's not conservative, but a certain kind of right winger who's strongly influenced by evangelical religion. So what do I think has happened? I think that the left, okay, we haven't yet talked about the moral disgust. There are people who point to the fact that people say things like, oh, those corrupt politicians disgust me, or those people who persecute others disgust me. And they want to say, well, now that's the way the left uses disgust. I do not think it's the same thing at all. No, people are loose with words. And there have been empirical studies that show that, yeah, people in different cultures do use disgust of that in that way. But what are they really trying to say? They're, sometimes I think they're just using it as an alternative for angry. I'm very angry at those people. And anger, although it has its own problems, is corrected. It means I want to get rid of that by correcting it. 
But distress, if that's what they really mean, it might not be, but if it is what they really mean, it means let me get out of here. Let me get away to some pure place. When I find myself feeling that kind of, as it were, left-wing disgust, the fantasy I always have is let me go to Finland. Because I've spent a lot of time in Finland, but not too much. So I know that it's a beautiful place with clear air, with no pollution, and lovely, pure water, and very nice, gentle people. And I don't know its own vices and corruptions deeply enough to find their politics disgusting. So I think it's a mistake. So when people say I'm disgusted by those corrupt politicians, I think they're saying what I'm saying when I say, let me go to Simlin. Let me get out of here. Let me get away from the contamination of these gross people. And that is not a useful or constructive response. Anger can sometimes be a constructive response. So I think if the left uses disgust in that way, it's not helpful. And I would discourage anyone from using, I would never want to compare any, any kind of political opponent to a slimy, sticky, cockroachy person. Even though I have such thoughts about some politicians, I remember when I was giving the Jefferson lecture for the National Endowment of the Humanities, there was the real possibility that President Trump would come. And I remember thinking, will I shake his hand? And I mean, first of all, I do, I'm a little phobic about handshaking anyway, not just because of COVID, but because of just germophobia. As an amateur singer, I have lots of germophobia. And interestingly, that's one thing Trump and I have in common. But I think I did have a disgust thought that it would be sort of like a rat was in that hand, that I'd be touching a rat. And so, of course, that's a terrible thing. I mean, I think Trump can be condemned in all kinds of ways, and I'm happy to do that. But my disgust reactions, I don't think are of any use to anyone, and I would discourage any politician from using those tropes. So it seems that disgust has been a useful mechanism to censor certain kinds of books or censure certain kinds of behavior. There's a view that cancel culture emanates from the left at universities and that certain people feel disdain, let's say, for ideas that they disagree with and that they want those people shut up or censored. Do you think that comes from a place of disgust. I mean, there's a sense in which when people are polled, they feel disgusted about marrying someone who's part of the other political tribe, that it revolts them in a way that people during the 50s might have been revolted by the idea of interracial marriage. So is that kind of propulsion for censorship coming from a place of disgust? Is it coming from some other emotional state? And what is the view that we should have about, let's say, tolerating views that we find offensive in a broader category? Yeah, I think it comes from a related place. I'm not sure it's exactly the same thing. It comes from an interest in homogeneity and policing homogeneity. So that's the similarity. I think the difference is that people really want to stamp out these views as evil, not because they're disgusting, but because they think they're morally bad, but morally bad without having examined them, without having had an argument about them and so on. So I think that so long as views are expressed with civility, we should and must debate them. I've actually given one of my big prizes to establish in our law school a series of what are called Nussbaum lunches, where two people with very different opinions, faculty members, get together a group of students who also have very different opinions. And for an hour and a half, we discuss them with civility. And that is the rule. Come prepare to be civil. The last one I had, and I always do it with Will Bode, who's a libertarian, and so he would count as sort of on the right, but he's very gentle and very civil, and a lovely person. And we've done them about drugs and legalizing hard drugs. But the last one we did was on abortion. And there, his wife, who's very left-wing, predicted this is going to test the principle of the no lunches because it's going to regenerate this name-calling and canceling. But interestingly, it didn't. My strategy was to call first on a student that I knew, and I knew her to be a very thoughtful student, and I also knew that she was a conservative Catholic. And she was great because she said, oh, well, I used to be a member of these pro-life groups, but I found them too narrow and too extreme in such and such ways, and I therefore drifted away. And this permitted lots of other views to come out. 
well, some who still were in the groups, others who also had drifted away, then people from other religions, people with no religion. So we actually had a pretty wonderful discussion. And I think we can have that discussion. I think social media make that very difficult. We're just hiring now in our philosophy department a feminist who's actually said some very controversial things and controversial to other feminists. And what I'm interested in is that she's never been canceled. But the reason is she says these things in journals, not on social media. I myself am never on social media. So I just think that encourages kind of cascades of violent sentiment that are not thought through. So I think that is quite damaging. So the more we can do to encourage kids to take philosophy classes, that's one reason that I think all undergraduates should have liberal arts education where they take philosophy classes and they really learn to think these things through and argue with stability. I think we can do that and that it would have a great beneficial effect on our entire culture. So of course, I'm arguing from an easy case when I talk about law school, but in a way not. I think that there are other law schools who encourage the other kind of expression, like Yale is totally different. And just being reasonable and trying to think seems to me something we have to stand for and we have to make people do that. So yeah, that's what I have been struggling to do. Have you found that over time, the issues that people were repelled by have changed dramatically? That let's say the materials that students would have found incredibly offensive 20 years ago are totally different to what students find offensive now? Well, I guess some students, I mean, I've always, when I teach feminism, I'm always teaching the very same things and the people have not changed that much. And the homophobia too, if they're in a course of mine, they probably are ready to think. So I've found that over the years, however, people vote with their feet and they don't take classes from somebody they think they disagree with. So when I used to teach feminist philosophy, I would have a lot of conservative people in that class. And one of our most conservative faculty members, although again, he's libertarian, but not a kind of mega conservative, he took that class because his fiance said to him, Todd, got to learn something about feminism. So he went and took the class. That would not happen today. So I think the difference is that people are not opening their minds as much to the views of the other side. And that's why I created these Muslim lunches because they won't take a whole class for me, but they might be prepared to spend an hour and a half in the company of someone they disagree with. That's that much thinking they can be expected to do. I think that where things have not changed enough. Now, of course, with disability, things have moved along very nicely, but where things have not changed enough is age because people are disgusted by people who are aging and they're disgusted because it reminds them of what will happen to them and their own mortality. And they shrink from that and they never, I think no person will stop shrinking from their own mortality. You can't really ask people to reconcile themselves to death. And I don't actually even think that would be a good thing to do because I think we need to fight death and discover new remedies and so forth. But age discrimination in society is enormous, not just in law, but in just daily behavior. If you go in as a patient, and of course, at my age, you have to have a lot of appointments with different kinds of doctors, you find that if they know who you are, of course, it helps if you're the well-known professor in their own university. So if I go to somebody at the University of Chicago Hospital and I make sure to be well-dressed, wearing a suit and a necklace and so on, because I know full well, it's so easy for people to talk, baby talk to people who are aging, to think that their opinions don't count or anything like that. And I remember one appointment that I had where the young residents who were the worst because they haven't yet had to think about a wide range of patients, but they think, oh, patients don't count. In fact, my own doctor, my general internist is the head of a program that teaches empathy to doctors. He has an uphill battle with the arrogance of young doctors. So they started talking to me and not listening at all to what I had said. And so was, there was this doctor who was going to come later. And I said, well, how soon will Dr. J be? here because I brought my new book and I wanted to give it to her. All of a sudden, their attitude completely changed. Oh, this woman has written a book, so maybe I should count her. 
as someone. So that's the trouble with the medical profession. They don't really want to count anyone as fully human except themselves. And it's very hard to educate that out of people. So I think that's the sticky place. And we're all aging. We need all the respect that we deserve for having lived this long and tried hard to grapple with the problems of life. And we don't get it. We get people who speak baby talk and kind little squeaky voices. Oh, hello, hello, you know. And they, of course, they call you by your first name where they expect you to call them doctor. So anyway, I think that age discrimination, which is everywhere in society, is the hardest one because it betrays real fear. It's not like what Cicero nicely models in his Space Senate two-day dialogue where two young men, in their early 30s probably, come to Cato, who was supposed to be in his mid-80s, and they say, you know, we don't know much about aging, but we're sort of going to get there sooner or later, so tell us about it. And then Cato marches through all the stereotypes of aging, that aging people are stupid, inactive, etc. And he talks about his writings, learning languages, gardening, and all of the things that he does, and rides horseback, etc. And so that's how the dialogue goes. But it's interesting because it's written by Cicero, a man in his early 60s, and it's prefaced by a note to his best friend Atticus say, well, you and I, Atticus, are not really old yet, but we're getting there pretty quickly, so we better scout the terrain and find out what it's like. So that was his very curious and empathetic way of approaching aging. He didn't get there because he was assassinated, but anyway, he was looking ahead in the right way, and so we're the young man that he thinks. People in this very youth-centered culture, they just think it's doomed to grow older. They don't respect people who are older. And I mean, there are plenty of exceptions, of course. And one exception that I particularly love, because it comes from the world of athletics, that's one of the most youth-centered of all, do you know who Sister Jean is? You probably haven't heard of her. Okay, so the local Catholic University, Loyola University of Chicago, has a very good basketball team that's been in the NCAA finals. And they have a mascot who is uh, named Sister Jean, who is 102 years old now. But I mean, this big hype around Sister Jean began about 10 years ago. So every year, the NCAA finals time, Sister Jean comes out and blesses the team and says, words of uplift and hope, but she's fun. I mean, she's not super serious. She has a sense of humor. And so it's celebrated just recently of her 102nd birthday. But this is the right way to be, to celebrate the very existence of the ongoing engagement of somebody who's that age. No, we don't often get there.